So my name is Greg, I'm with Braintech. Uh, quite a few of you know me. Uh, we uh, run an IT services company here in the Houston area. Uh, we do um, IT support and security and whatnot. And uh, I wanted to uh, invite Rod down here. Uh, here's a little bit about me. You know, I've been uh, doing Braintech for uh, 21 years now. Uh, if you guys uh, want, you can read our book about cybersecurity. And uh, I met a couple of different people. I've been featured in a couple of different magazines and MSP Success. And uh, you know, we're, we're trying to keep hackers away from uh, everybody's networks and keep their networks up and running. And I wanted to uh, bring Rod down here. He's the butt kicker here of uh, cyber criminals. He's been doing a great job doing that. Uh, he's also this uh, evangelist of, I, uh, of AI. He's been going around talking to a lot of people and I thought it'd be a great idea to have him come talk to y'all. Uh, about what uh, AI can do for your business. And uh, he's trying to also destroy slow networks and whatnot. So Ron, tell us more about yourself. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming out here. I've been featured on the Fortune 5000, fastest growing companies uh, two different times, best-selling author, AI and cybersecurity speaker, and I founded Cooley Tech about 20 years ago. So probably the same time as Greg. So who here has used any AI before? Like ChatGPT, or Bing uh, Copilot or any of those. All right, so who here has never used an AI in any official capacity? All right, that's all right. So most of us, I'm not gonna give you a big history lesson here, right? But we've all referred to the term, or heard the term at least from the Industrial Revolution. Obviously Houston was a big part of that as uh, the oil boom came here in 1800s and 1900s, right? But we're at now the dawn of the fifth Industrial Revolution which is the intellectual or digital machine revolution. And AI is far more than hype. And now it's on every newspaper. Uh, if any of your vendors want to go ahead and get a bump in sales, they put the word AI in front of whatever product they're launching. And everyone's like, oh yeah, I need that thing, right? So there is a lot of hype associated to AI. And it normally refers, uh, people try it out like, well, that's not really as cool as I thought it was, right? But AI in the appearance sense, and we'll educate a little bit on what those different aspects mean. Today's cap capabilities where for most businesses, when I'm mentoring them on how to use AI, it's great for from an HR perspective or business leader perspective, creating your SOPs, creating your policies and procedures, uh, HR and legal suggestions. I want to highlight the suggestion component there. You still need your uh, actual people looking at that marketing sales, financial and drafting emails. But more so, what is fueling the, dr the drive of all this AI revolution that we're seeing, right? Why is it at the front of every newspaper article that you're reading? And why is everyone so excited about this? The first step is massive AI investments and advancements that we're seeing. Now the hardware, now does everyone understand what computer hardware is? So here, like a lot of you brought your digital devices and over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen those become far more capable, far more powerful. We can uh, you know, play Minesweeper much better these days, but uh, the hardware capabilities that are increasing from an AI component are significantly higher above that. And as we get more and more hardware, we get better and better AIs. If anyone used an AI three years ago, uh, Grammarly was probably one of the first predictive text AIs that you've seen. You'd be able to finish a single sentence and it'd do a decent job of it, right? Whereas now you have AIs that can write a whole paper and do it very, very, very well. Well, as they advance from their AI, uh, hardware components, they then can trade more advanced models and they have the ability to do significantly more intelligent components. So this gentleman here, CEO of NVIDIA. Well, now who here has heard of NVIDIA? Should have bought their stock, right? If you've done any stock investment, that's probably what you're thinking. Most of you have probably heard it uh, from a graphics card perspective where you get an NVIDIA graphics card, you can do play better games, model different 3D models. However, a little history on this guy. <clears throat> Early to 2010s, Graphics cards were about all he did. Now, as luck would have it for him, who here's heard of the Bitcoin before, right? One of the ways that you were able to mine Bitcoin was through graphics cards. There were certain model uh, AI Bitcoin, or there were certain Bitcoins that would allow you to mine those coins from there. His stock went through the roof when that happened because everyone wanted to get their hands on these graphics cards that could go ahead and make actual money. You could turn a profit on those. Allowed him to gain a significant advantage in the marketplace. Luckily for him, the next revolution as Bitcoin kind of leveled off, even though I think we're at $65,000 for a coin right now, is AI models use graphical processing units to go ahead and run all their calculations. So he had already had numerous years of how do I make the best, fastest, most powerful chips to go ahead and do this. 
this here. Actually, can we turn off those lights? We'll just be in the dark a little bit here. So this, now teraflops, I'm not going to go give you guys a history lesson on what a teraflop is or anything like that. Let's just say it's a lot of data, all right? So in 2016, the chipset that they were using, which was uh, Pascal at the time, could do about 19 teraflops. To make this easier, let's put that in horsepowers, right? 19 horsepower is about what your tractor, lawn tractor that mows your lawn does, give or take. Well, as a years progressed, the one that was just launched two months ago does 20,000. That's about a locomotive or a large uh, um, destroyer that the U.S. military has. In a matter of 10 years, we had a thousand times improvement in just the raw hardware that can run these machines or run these algorithms. These are a number of different AI models, and I'll give you about a 10 minute on each one. Just kidding, I'm not gonna go into that. But over here, you see a nice upward track, right? We wish all our 401k was doing this. But each one of these levels is not linear. These are to the power of 10. So every level is 10 times stronger from an AI model capability perspective. Now looking at these numbers here, if we look at next, next year or two years or three years from now, where do we suspect our model capability and our hardware capability are gonna move us to, right? We're probably gonna continue going up because they're throwing tons of cash and the smartest and brightest people in the world are trying to find out how do I make a better model? And how do I, in a model, we all have Ford, Chevys, whatever, you know, a 2010 versus 2015 versus 2020 versus 2024 model has different bells and whistles, features. They have cooler LED screens on them now. And uh, every model that comes out has the same thing, new, better capabilities. Go to Wisconsin as a Wisconsin native. We're going to be getting a $100 billion computer. Now, this computer, I expect it to be uh, start construction in 2026 is going to take five nuclear power plants to run. So the entire state of Wisconsin right now uses 5.5 gigawatts of power on a yearly basis. This here is a five gigawatt computer. This computer here will double the world's processing capability with one individual data center. It can do as much data transfer on the back end as the entire internet does. And this computer, once it's fully completed, will allow you to build and train models that are unimaginable compared to what we can do today. Because the biggest limitation right now in new AI model creation, so ChatGPT 3.5, 4.0, yeah, anyone that's following saw the Lambda came out, uh, all, the, all these different models, their CPU power is what they're trying to get. Because the more they get, the better model they can get. And then they use those same CPU power to go ahead and actually run the model. So when we go and make our poems and our kitty pictures and stuff like that, that's what's being run in there. So this here, and the CEO of OpenAI wants 70 of these computers across the world. And Google, not to be outdone, said, hey, we're gonna go build a $100 billion computer too. So how do we power that? I mean, we already have a power energy problem. So how are we going to- understand. Oh, I said Google, see that? Oh, stop it. Uh, that's a good question. Now, luckily for us in Wisconsin, we don't have a power issue. We have a state can produce 17.5 uh, gigawatts of power. We use 5.5. We actually export power. And uh, I was at a talk last week and spoke to one of the directors at Dairyland Power, a large uh, co-op uh, in the area that fuels all like the 17 local co-ops. He's like, yeah, every five years or so, we can double our power capabilities. So at least in Wisconsin, now again, what is the population of Texas? 34. 34 million, we have a population of 6 million. We also have 20% of the world's fresh water supply touching our borders at all time, plus the start of the Mississippi. So we have plenty of fresh, clean water for uh, cooling these type of units. Our ground temperature is about 40 degrees versus your guys is, uh, I think about 65, give or take. So we just have access, so geothermal for cooling, much more efficient. And Wisconsin, if Russia, China, North Korea were gonna launch a missile at us, well, you have to go through a lot of air defense to hit anything in Wisconsin, don't you? So it's a perfect from a, both a military perspective, a, a key infrastructure and a resource perspective, which I suspect, now again, they don't go lay that out on, hey, why do we choose Wisconsin? But that's probably uh, has at least a part of a reason on why they did that, but. Hey, but you still have state income tax, so. We do, all right, so we're not perfect, right? <laughs> and your guys' winters will beat ours any day of the week. <laughs> so that's just on the hardware perspective, right? That's the raw horsepower that's running these type of things. We also have software models. 
Now, the software models are the actual thing that you guys are probably used to using. ChatGPT 3.5, 4.0, Claude, if you've used that. Meta AI has a new one that comes out you can go build some stuff with. Um, Snapchat even has an AI you can sit and chat with all day long, and my daughter loves it. And my, my wife, who's not nearly as excited about all this AI stuff as I am, she's like, you know, I was looking at that thing, and it actually, it's pretty good, you know? So that's from a so software perspective. It's just the stuff that you're used to installing on your computer. Well, these were on, on those type of those big, giant pieces of hardware. In 2021, Goldman Sachs estimated that we made about $210 billion invested. In a matter of two years, they were 50% wrong or 40% wrong on that. We spent $150 billion. And that was before any of those major investments I talked to you about, like the $100 billion computers that all the giant tech companies are saying, hey, we're going to go build every type of, if I can get, they can get the money. It's literally the, pro, the production capability of these processors are where the limit is. And most are saying, and this will connect well with you guys in Houston, that processing power is the new oil. That companies and power or companies and capability are limited, not by electricity or anything, but it's literally how much processing can they get done. So how smart is ChatGPT? The average IQ of the U.S. Uh, citizen is 100, and they adjust that based off if we get smarter, they bring it down. It's just just how they do it. That's, that's average. Top 10% of individuals are at 120, and the top 1% are at 133. ChatGPT, according to a, a Scientific America test done two weeks ago, ChatGPT has an IQ of 153. That's level. That's Einstein level. So anyone here who's used ChatGPT might challenge me on that. Be like, I've used it. There's no Einstein, right? Today's AI are the dumbest AI that the human race will ever work with. Those of us that use any AI have seen tremendous improvements, even in the last two years. In the next two years, you're going to see even more. So today's AIs, while they have their limitations, are as stupid and dumb as they'll get. From here on out, they're only going to get smarter and smarter and smarter. However, this here is a graph of different intellectual levels. Here, image classification. Most of us have seen that when you take a picture on Facebook, they can find your friends on it. They can normally categorize a dog. They've been doing that for about a decade, right? Basic level reading comprehension, that's where you can give it some text and they can kind of summarize it. And this here is your human standard level. English understanding, visual reasoning, taking a look at a picture and seeing what's going on inside this picture. These are benchmarks that about 2021, all of them were at about the average human capability. Two that were specifically lagging, multitask language understanding. So that's similar to if you want to have a conference here, where do you want it? What do you need? Who do you have to contact? Basically creating your daisy chain of long lists of things that need to do and figuring out how to do each one of those steps. That's where AI have been lagging. Though, it's getting pretty close to being able to match that of an average human. Now, that's an average. You have an industry expert. Uh, there, it's still going to be a little below that, right? But if you look at where these graphs are going, there's a lot of value in this. Once these two hit human or above, you get into what's called a term uh, artificial general intelligence. That's where an AI is as smart and capable as the average human in America. So let's start out by, for those that haven't used this a little bit, here we have a write a poem about the woodlands. So this one is called Claude. We're going to go through a couple different models for you to show you what they actually are capable of. Because in the heart of Texas, where the pine tree or tan straw lies a master plan, the woodlands they call. From Market Street, bustling with shoppers. Wow, that huge landing offers dining and more. So that's that poem. I copy and pasted it so you guys can read it yourself. So Claude, which came out two months ago, a month and a half ago, it dethroned ChatGPT 4.0 as the most powerful model that is out there. Now, ChatGPT 4, not to be outdone, went ahead and released a secret update that they then put themselves directly above that. But that there has some very unique information, specifically about the woodlands, right? Not about Houston general area or general. The AI generally knows about this particular town. And I've done this in La Crosse, and I've done this in every where I speak, and it does a great job of finding very local references and then rhyming them together. Most of us in this room would have difficulty creating a uh, poem with any amount of time, let alone in five seconds, right? However, some general use cases that use this. Now at Cooley Tech, 
all of our job postings are built by AI. So here you can go ahead and create a job tech or a Cooley tech help desk position. Highlight how we are butt kickers. So it will go online, find information about Cooley Tech. I didn't tell it that we're in La Crosse, Wisconsin, or any of those type of things. It'll fill out most of that. Cooley Tech, renowned for its butt kicking IT solutions and dynamic company. Trusted partner by manufacturing healthcare throughout Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. And that's just stuff that came directly from my website. There it cited the source on where it found that for me. And if you go on Indeed, or if you're posting those jobs, that's a pretty reasonable job description for a help desk position, right? However, here, maybe we're going to do some marketing. So this one is a Bing chat, which is uh, also known as Copilot. You can get the $30 upgrade to get this embedded within all of your 365 Microsoft suite as a whole. Now, the reason Microsoft is leading the pack in this industry, because Back in 2019, before all this AI hap happened, they made an investment of $10 billion into a small company called OpenAI. With that, they give $10 billion of credit into their servers, which is the most expensive component of their product, with a small little caveat. They wanted access to all the source code OpenAI ever wrote. So when they did that, anything that you see from OpenAI, which is the ChatGPT model, Microsoft has access. They can just embed it directly into their product, and they don't have to spend anything. So here we work well with clients 200 to uh, or 20 to 200. We have a 99% time, at a $100 payout if we don't return voicemails. So here it gives me ideas on what can I do from a marketing perspective if I want to grow my market base in the cross area. Go target, adverti target advertisement, content marketing, SEO, email marketing, networking, referral programs, which are all pretty good stuff, but it's very, very basic, right? I mean, uh, you open up first page of any marketing book, that's the type of stuff that they're gonna go ahead and refer. So I ask it, all right, those are good. Could you write me a Facebook ad? So I want a sample Facebook ad that I could go ahead and actually put out on Facebook so I could deploy that. And, highlight, and I want, I'm telling you, I wanted to highlight part of what I, I didn't tell it what I am unique at, right? I just said, hey, write me something that's for how I'm unique. So it goes, creates a nice little ad, and I have a little copy button in the corner there, so I need to copy that page, puts a little emojis in there. Why would you want to choose us? Insert my company name, because in this particular prompt, I didn't tell it I was with Cooley Tech. So there in a matter of a minute, I'm able to go ahead and get actual copy I can go ahead and start marketing with on Facebook, or maybe as a Facebook post, or any really any, any type of copy you're looking for. As long as you can articulate to it, what are you looking for? And you can go ahead and keep challenging. If, it, if I didn't like this, I can say, hey, let's go ahead and kill the emoji, emojis, right? I'm not a teenager anymore. So then I'll say, it'd go back and rewrite the emojis. Or I can say, hey, I want more emojis. My clients are loving those things. Research HR law for quick ideas. Now, this is an application that we built uh, with Claude. Now, I am not a developer, and uh, we have developers at our firm. It, I built this entire thing in about four hours, give or take. What this does is it integrates in, in fact, I'll show you here, integrates in with th uh, six of the major AIs, uh, Gemini 1.5, I use Claude, a couple models there, OpenAI, and I am able to go ahead and run a test along multiple of them, both from how long does it take, and I have a little link on the top there for when I do talks that we can go ahead and reference that if we're gonna do some live uh, workshopping put my company name in there, and then I can see from a different model which one does the best response for me. One way I've used this internally is I've done prompt engineering so that way every support ticket we're getting can get categorized by an AI so I can get it routed quickly to an individual that can go in and solve that particular instance. And through here, I'm able to find which one does it both the fastest as well as which one does it the most accurate. So I can rerun it three at a time, and each time is it actually categorizing these different tickets accurately. Now this takes a little bit more, I'd say geek knowledge to go, be able to execute, but it doesn't take software development knowledge. That gentleman I was referring to you uh, earlier on, the CEO of NVIDIA, he cites that within five years, there will be no software developers anymore. That is a field that is literally unneeded. Because at the heart of it, 
All a software developer is, is a translator between a human and a computer. And with language models, if the language can understand what you're looking at doing, you don't need the middleman anymore. However, AI isn't limited to your computers anymore. Has anyone seen this video? Yeah, probably because I sent it to you. Now let's see if it'll send it. I've had some trouble with, uh... yeah, I thought so. But luckily this time I'm prepared to show you it without it in here. Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate, and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Great, can I have something to eat? Sure thing. This robot is angry in with open AI. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. Great. So based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great, can you put them in? Of course. All right, so how do you think you did? I, I think I did pretty well. The apple found its new owner, the trash is gone, and the tableware is right where it belongs. I agree. Thanks, figure one. You're welcome. If there's anything else you need help with, just let me know. So that robot, now robots are nothing new, right? I think in the 60s and 70s, they started putting manufacturing robots within automobile plants to help automate the highly refined mass-produced products, right? That robot there, while it looks pretty cool, Boston Dynamics, which is a company that's been around for about 20 years, has been doing far more impressive things than that particular robot did for a number of years. What makes that robot unique is that humans did not do any software development to get it so it would manipulate the apple or the glass or any of those. That robot can literally walk from a bipedal perspective to a table, it, it, look at using visual sensory, identify what needs to happen on there, and program itself to manipulate each of those different components. Now, NVIDIA, that company I referred to, releases a model like this to go ahead and train these AI, or train these robots, so that way they can go and run a million tests for a million years inside these large amounts of computation, and whichever robot it identifies, or whichever randomized process it found did it best, gets uploaded into the robot, and then it goes and executes that particular route. They have humanoid robot labs that these things are running in these computers to find out how do I make it walk, how do I make it interact with the environment, how do I make it work upstairs, downstairs, through rough environments. And again, they can run digitally for a million years in a robot because you can emulate, you can speed up time within a computer, and then you get out of that the actual robot that can walk and interact with your real world. There's my buddy from NVIDIA, right? He has 10 of these robots that are using his technology that is gonna be coming onto the market at the end of 2024 and 2025. Our buddy Elon Musk has Optimus. Optimus also has a release date anticipated to be 2025. Now, we were talking a little before the meeting here on how much some of these uh, robots would cost. How much do you think the market price of that particular robot is gonna be? Now, this robot has already shown that it can fold laundry, or fold laundry, it can pick up apples, it can pick up an egg, manipulate it, cook with it. You can do really almost any human level task a little slower, but when your labor rate are pennies of electricity per hour, 
you can afford to do it a little bit slower because you have 100 of them doing it. This robot is looking for $20,000 is how much he wants to release this out to the marketplace for. Now, Elon Musk is oftentimes uh, overly optimistic with his uh, predictions, right? However, most of his predictions end up being about 50% off. So this one here would be $30,000. From a business perspective, how long would it take you to recoup $30,000 investment if it can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doesn't complain, doesn't form a union, doesn't go ahead and file sexual harassment charges. If you hit it with a forklift, you don't have to go file any paperwork or go ahead and talk to anyone's family. So the AI future is here right now. The stuff that I'm showing here is not science fiction. It's not the stuff that, hey, it'd be cool if we could do this type of stuff. These are things that are working right now in a lab and they're just getting it ready for production. And a lot of these things, you guys have the capability, like those models are showing, of using right now. But why should you care, right? Maybe you like the way things are right now. Maybe you're like, I don't want any of this type of AI items within our environment. Well, you guys were hit with a hurricane a couple of years ago, right? When you heard that the hurricane was coming, did you sit around a room and talk about, well, I don't really like hurricanes. I'm not a big fan of hurricanes. I'd prefer we don't have hurricanes, right? It, it, we're not debating on whether or not we like the, what is coming. This is coming. It is not stopping. No regulations are going to stop this, right? Because you can make all AI illegal in the United States, China, North Korea, Russia, Iran. They will happily go invest $100 billion into AI, and then people will use VPNs to go use their AI. This is the future that is coming, and it's coming, and we need to be, as business leaders, prepared for it, both training our staff on, here's how you use AI. I believe that within five years, the only expertise that will matter is your ability to interact with an AI. Now, that's not a very popular one, especially for those of us that have spent 20 years in cybersecurity or in IT. But John Henry with the uh, steam engine, he lost, right? In fact, if you go look, lamp lighters, ice cutters. Now, maybe you guys never had ice cutters down here because I don't know if the lakes freeze. But in northern Wisconsin, you would go ahead and cut the ice, store it all winter, and you'd sell ice to individuals. However, the compressor made that so it was no longer the case. Switchboard operators, film projectors, and video store clerks. Who here remembers going on a Friday night to a Best Buy, taking a look at the list of movies out of there, hoping that that new release is out, right? So you're not even old enough to say Blockbuster. <laughs> I'm sorry, Blockbuster, not Best Buy. That's actually my example. <laughs> at its peak in 2004, they had 9,000 stores. If you had went into the CEO and told him, hey, in a decade, you're going to go bankrupt. No one's going to use your service. He would have laughed you out of the room, right? If you had told anyone that Blockbuster is not going to be a business anymore, they would have laughed at you. Back in, those of us that remember living in 2004, because this was the peak of a Friday night experience. However, in a matter of a decade, they completely lost their ability. Now, Blockbuster is a very unique story because they had the capability of pivoting. Does anyone here know what they had the opportunity to do? Looks like you might. Netflix came to them and said, tell you what, if you bought, give us $50 million, less money than they pay in electricity at all their stores, we'll give you our Netflix deal. You know what the CEO told them? This model will never work. People like coming to our store. They like seeing the stuff. And those of us from the late 90s, early 2000s, we did. We enjoyed going there. That was fun. Now, yeah, you had to make sure to rewind it or return it. Or, but it was a fun experience. And the idea that you'd rob people of that fun experience, they'd choose to not have that, it's just intellectually seemed un unimaginable. But market forces always beat feelings. And we see that with uh, Blockbuster. And we go down, I could do a whole speech. I, do you know who invented the first digital camera? Kodak. They chose not to pursue it because they thought it would hurt their film business. Xerox invented the modern lab, but they didn't want to do it because it hurt their paper business. Like they could have literally patented and been the only person to have personal computers and own the digital revolution that came out of it, but they wanted to protect paper sales. Kodak wanted to protect film sales. Now both of those, Xerox still in business, but nowhere near the titan of, their, uh, of the laptop industry or the server industry which they invented. Inaction has a huge price. AI-empowered humans or businesses will lead today's market and will eliminate anyone 
who isn't using them tomorrow. As business leaders, we are unable to compete against a fellow competitor that is empowering major aspects of their business with AI. You just can't compete. I, I don't care what industry you are, I can write more resumes with AI than you could ever write uh, with your WordPad, and you could be a 50-year experience with it. So AI won't take your job, but those using it will, AI will. If we're in a room of uh, farmers from 1850, in 1850, 90% of the US economy was built uh, around the production of agriculture. Today, it is less than 5%. Though, if any of you have any job ads right now, there is not an 85% unemployment rate, is there? Right? Same thing with this. I can't tell you what the new jobs are gonna be in 10 years. But every single major industrial revolution that we have seen does not lead to mass employment. It leads to unknown jobs of what the future is, but jobs for those individuals that understand how to use the revolution that came. And now this revolution here is gonna take over the industry faster than any of those. Back when the, first, uh, the industrial revolution occurred, John Deere needed to make tractors, right? You had to build factories, you had to design them, you had to go ahead and there was a limit for that. OpenAI, when they released it, they were the first application to within one month get 100 million users. AI can be rolled out simply by a software update. It doesn't require major investments. So from, a, from your guys' perspective, finding and utilizing AI within your environment is the most important thing I think you guys can do from a business leader perspective, both for the betterment of your personal employees or your own career, as well as from an industry. However, that was all the good sides of AI. There's also some very negative dark sides to AI that we need to address. Who here has had the Nigerian prince try to make them rich before? <laughs> right? Well, modern AI have the ability, especially as more of these become open source. And if you don't know what open source, it basically means that whoever wants to edit it can. You get the ability to edit it and run it your own without any limits or limitations. Well, they can have AI that go and watch your Facebook and see that you posted a picture from the church bake sale and then go and send you an email phishing you from that church receptionist saying, hey, can you go fill this up, update your donor guide? Or they can also go ahead and you see you're on vacation. Well, they can then initiate a, hey, your credit card just got denied here. Click here to approve it. And they've got your credentials for logging into your credit card. Or if you got a new job, send an email directly to, hey, we're from IT here. Can you please update your password? But that's not the biggest concern I have from an AI perspective. You're going to see a lot more of these. However, we have a phone emulation voice phishing. Now, I've done a lot of speaking in Wisconsin to the Department of Health and Human Services. Some of the stories I'm hearing from them are make, my own, make myself want to become Amish and go ahead and get rid of all these computers. They, so in Wisconsin, and some of these are from gentlemen or people here in Texas, but in Wisconsin, they're working with elderly population who believe they're talking to like John Lennon or famous uh, you know, 60s and 70s uh, music stars that they, this the elderly population believe are calling them, but they use, phone, they use AI phone emulation. So it sounds like that individual and knows all about their music. And then in return, they send them thousands of dollars because they're a little hard on the, they're hard up right now for money. They don't want to tell anyone about it. And these are, and they're like, well, how can I teach them not to? I'm like, I have no idea. How do you protect against that? Train for that. These here are a couple in the last year that have happened. Texas man in May had $1,000 distress from his grandson. So his grandson called him and said, hey, I'm in prison. Had the voice, tone, pitch of his grandson. And he sent $1,000 to a hacker to get him out of prison, even though his grandson was nowhere, wasn't in the prison. So hiring remote workers. Now this one's gonna be very interesting. Who here has at least one or more remote workers? All right, a couple of you, right? Does it, an AI can go ahead and fill out almost any of these online applications. I was working with one business owner that they, until they got to the in-person one, they were about ready to write the job off. They're like, well, we'll just go do an in-person interview with them uh, as a last step. When that in-person interview happened, they realized that the person had no idea how to do the job. They had used AI to fill out every test. They had used AI to go ahead and uh, fill, I mean, everything was remote and digital. So if you're doing a video screen, you can have a monitor up there. Hold on, we'll get to that video. Uh, they had a second screen, they just ask a question and be able to respond back intelligently. 
So until the person was sitting there, they had no, just no idea. This person had no, no idea. But AI was able to empower that unknowledgeable individual with the knowledge they needed. This one here. do I decided to focus all my tension all my time on listening so instead of so if this person was head, giving you a I zoom call listened, listened, would you believe that's a real human listened because I'm a true believer that if you're really bad at something like listening for example it only shows you that hey you have to practice listening as much as you can now you're zoomed in right Higher quality. Generating lifelike talking if that was on a small little box on your Zoom, grainy Zoom camera here, could this person get a job at your company and then work remotely? If AI can go ahead and answer their emails, do a reasonable job at so, uh, answering the questions you have on there. Do the work and even join a Zoom call that they go ahead and participate in the weekly calls and such. Now, maybe not your particular, as you, if you have smaller enough companies, but this is a major issue going to be for the large companies that come out that works in a face latent space. And, the and to get that, all they had to do is copy and paste an image and put it in there, and then it continues the video from that person forward. Might as well go ahead and do that one. I'll get to that, that's a good question. This here also, if anyone has seen Sora, this is text to video. So much like you've done uh, text prompting, you saw I go and create a, a job description, text to image, you go and type a little something in there and it uh, gives you an image. This here, they typed a single prompt and it made a full video. That city street, that lady, the people in the background, none of that is real. There was a movie company that was gonna do an $800 million expansion to their theater or to their uh, firm. They canceled it as soon as they saw this because this here is how they said movies are gonna be made in the future. There's no need for an $800 million investment on that. Because you can't tell that's not a real, like look at the reflection in her eyes. Uh, the zoomed in uh, facial pores. Now, there are imperfections, but highlight again, this is the worst it's ever going to be. Tomorrow, six months, a year, it's going to be 10 times better. Like one of the, like she didn't have a bun before and there were just little things like that. Do we have an ETA on that? So I'm super excited about it. <laughs> I'll bet you are. Uh, ironically enough, on that one here, let me get back to my... So how you get ready for, or that'll be available when we get more computation. Right now their limitation on it is that, so the, there's a hopper chip that's out right now, which is, uh, that one's the, anyway, there's a chip right now, it's about $20,000. To make one of those one minute segments takes that chip 20 minutes to do. So you need to, plus the electricity to run and stuff like that, but that's really the limitations that they don't have the ability to mass scale that to, the population yet like they did with ChatGPT because there's not enough processing power in the world to do it yet. Now, they once they figure out how to do it, normally other providers are about six months behind the industry leader like that. So you'll have someone that can go ahead and buy their own $20,000 chip. And so if you want to go buy a $20,000 chip, you can. And then uh, you can go ahead and process your own out there. There's a number of uh, chips out there that are openly available for the, because even if it took you an hour to make a minute, well, you can do it 24 minutes a day, right? You can just queue it up, come in the next day. These are my 24, I'll set up my 24 next prompt and then keep doing that. In a matter of a week, you could have a full feature film of an hour and a half film that was made entirely by an AI. And you can, those, uh, that technology, Sora, you can extend a film, stop a film, put a single picture in there and then have it continue to generate it out of there. But how do you combat that? From the site, like, uh, so Greg and I meet weekly as well as uh, every quarter in person, just to talk about how can we, from a cybersecurity perspective, counter a lot of these major advancements that are coming out there. Because they are, like two years ago, we were not talking about how does someone go ahead and make sure that the person they're calling is actually the person that's calling them, right? But when you have voice emulation that can match tone, pitch, identically, if, if you guys are bosses here and you call one of your employees, you expect them to do what you said, right? I, I do. So uh, this adds an aspect into it, like you need to train your employees that just because I call and tell you to do something, you need to do some policy and procedure to make sure that I'm actually who you say you are. And that for, you need to empower them 
So that way, if you don't do what your policy said, they won't do it. It doesn't matter if you're in front of this giant customer that you need this immediately and you don't have time to do the policy right, because the AI and the hackers will tell the uh, scripts to pretend to do that, right? They'll say, hey, I'm with this client and these AI people are watching your, saw you went on an airplane because you went out on Facebook and said, hey, going to Houston, so they know you're at three hour blackout time, go and do the attack right at that point there. So you're with the client, you landed early, go reset my password or whatever, whatever they, however they're going to monetize that. So the only way I know of it is to, on the front side, have a policy and procedure in place where you have to say a special code word or and something that isn't digital, right? That is literally written on paper, ironically. But And these are going to continue to evolve. As the AI technology continually gets to be more and more complex, new threats come out that we didn't even... I had a client that a month ago, uh, their phone was literally... I don't know if it was cloned or hacked, but and it wasn't from a SIM swap. It was, uh, they had a digital swim in the, sim in the new ones. So we were calling and it went to some guy in Dubai. And this is a CEO of a major, it does about 80 million a year. We went down to Verizon, got the phone just completely reset. We call it again, goes to Dubai. And I'm like, the Verizon guy said, I'm like, that can't happen. I'm like, that can't happen. I'm like, well, it is happening. I'm calling them right now, right? Well, somehow they had gotten into the system and had a backend uh, forward all calls to this, where even on the phone, full reset didn't fix that. And they did email and stuff like that, and we were able to catch that. If they had had voice transfer uh, or voice emulation within that attack, they would have got $1.3 million because that's what they were trying to do when they emailed the bank. And the bank called to verify, which was part of their process. And that verification call went to the person in Dubai, and the banker just happened to recognize that that's not who I'm talking to. Otherwise, so these are the type of attacks that are not only going to happen, they're going to accelerate significantly. So... The combatant against more tech is less tech. Yes, which is ironic, isn't it? Stay away from your social media. Did any of you hear about the LastPass uh, hack recently where they actually did this particular thing he's talking about where they digitally sounded like the CEO calling staff at LastPass while he was away and what they, they just had a policy and procedure because they were the, the person that was trying to hack into this was doing it from uh, from abnormal sources. They were using WhatsApp to communicate, which the company didn't happen to use. And so as a result, the the, the employee that got this uh, the messages from this, this person knew that this wasn't kind of normal. And then they went through those channels and said, okay, well, I think this is a suspected attack, recorded it, documented it, and then followed their procedure internally. So coming up with those policies and procedures on what happens if someone calls acting as me, maybe it is me, and what are you going to do? And so you need to have those fail safes in, in your processes so that doesn't happen to you. And I'd say you as leaders need to empower your team underneath you that if I call you and ask for that, you have to tell me no. Right? Because all of us CEOs have our, I need to have that, I don't have time to talk to you voice, right? And any, anyone, any team member here has heard that voice before. It's a, I don't have time for that, this is really important, stop bothering me. That you need to empower them and almost train them at this point to say, look, if I ask you to break this policy, I need you to tell me no. And if you ever don't, I'm firing you. So you almost tell them, like, look, that's how important this is that if I'm calling you, I don't care if it's from my phone. I don't care if it looks like me. I don't care if I Teams message you. Because you saw I can fake your vo video voice, right? So, but and that's why it's a training issue far more than it is a tech issue. Because imp once you get an employee as your agent, They've already worked their way past all the security because they have credentials into whatever system is trying to be hacked. And especially like CFOs, they're going to have access to bank accounts, right? CEO calls a CFO. Normally, we do employees do whatever the, the boss says. And it, it really is a, a dynamic shift. But from a hiring perspective, you have to do in-person interviews, right? Realize that both from your perspective that an AI can answer any question that you would give it on a test. And it will do it better probably than you can. So that means that you have to have in-person interviews. So yes, less tech or more manual checks in place was the best way to combat automation. Nice little so segue into the next portion though. So something Greg's offering is an AI readiness security assessment. If any of you want that, uh, scan the QR code and we can set that up uh, and just see how ready are you guys from an AI perspective, assess 
how are you using it currently? How's the temperature of your current employees on that to find out what are some easy first wins you can do from an AI perspective, give them an opportunity to ask questions of what if AI is going to take over my job, right? Which is going to be one that you're going to get. And I think the easiest complex or uh, counter to that is if we as a company don't move forward in AI, none of us will have jobs. And I need to train you how to move forward in an AI digital raise because this stuff is not going anywhere. Now, every once in a while, you'll see on the news that people will try to say, oh, it's just an AI hype. And there are AI hypes, right? People that don't know what they're talking about say that their product is AI enabled and really they create a uh, funny little script that makes it look like an AI. But true AI is out there and it is accelerating faster than any of us are actually able to keep up with it. There's numerous releases that come out like, wow, I had no idea I could do that yet. But any, any other questions? Uh, Ron, can you speak to um, back doors and, and you know, long lasting, long lasting threats that are in people's networks and how AI can be enabled to crawl a network and develop uh, you know, the best plan of attack for this particular organization if they don't have the proper cybersecurity in place? Yeah. So does anyone know what is it's a little bit of a geeky question. So I'm going to I got to up my geek a little bit on that. But uh, um, anyone know what PowerShell is or coding languages? Right. So, yeah, uh, AI writes great PowerShell commands. They can write command line scripts. I can go ahead and scan your network. Uh, if there's a vulnerability, it literally just looks for the version number of your firewall of your server. Hey, are there any known vulnerabilities? And if there are returns back, how to automatically attack those? far better than any of the existing hackers that are out there. So just like from our workplace perspective, standard employees will not be able to compete against those that are AI empowered. From a hacker perspective, the hackers are quickly learning that, well, if I automate all this stuff with AI, I can go ahead and hack networks faster and quicker than I ever could by manually going doing a lot of these attacks. And from clients that I've seen get hit in the past, oftentimes I go look at them like, wow, if they had just known about this XYZ, they could have really done some damage. AI is going to make it so that way. They're not going to make that mistake anymore. That they're going to, if there's a vulnerability within your network, and it could be some of the biggest things that I'm seeing, like when you're doing a security assessment, your smart enabled toaster oven. Also now that can be a launch pad that they can go in, because if there's an ex exploit on there, they can go ahead and get it so they install their server on that particular toaster oven or the microwave or I think. Uh, your smart lights, your smart TV. Yeah. I mean, if you're not doing updates on that stuff. And who here has ever looked at whether or not their toaster oven is up to date from a security patch perspective, right? It sounds silly, but I think it was five years ago, uh, there was a casino in uh, Las Vegas that was hacked by a thermostat within the aquarium. It was an Android that they went ahead or they were able to install their own server inside that. And then once they're inside there, they're on the inside of the network. Then once you're on the inside of the network, you're, you're on the soft gooey side of the network. You no longer have that big old network uh, firewalls and such protection. So does that answer your question, Rick? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I was thinking more about the fact that um, most people's networks that are attacked, it's not like a simultaneous event. Like I, I get into your network and I attack you and steal your money today. Most um, hackers are in there a long time mm -hmm. watching your emails, watching your behaviors. And I certainly can see how AI would shorten the amount of time they need to do that because they can go back in time, reset the clock and see what you've been doing, you know, for the last year or whatever and reconstructing your entire organization's work and, and business. I mean, the thing that we teach our clients and I'm in a similar field as these two fellows is that um, this is a business for people, the stealing. We think of it as just crime, right? But that's that they do it. They do a nine to five job, just like we're doing a nine to five job. They're just doing it in Europe. And their job is to steal your money. So I think that, that your comments to the AI and, and the fact like this, the versions of the, the, um, the software on the um, firewalls and the servers and all those things, look known vulnerabilities. I hadn't really thought about that aspect. And I think that's also very on point. Any other questions? When you have the amount of dishonest people in the world doing what they do, now using AI to attack the honest people of the world. What is being done to protect this technology to circumvent not necessarily uh, huge amounts of regulation, but what, what's being done to protect the user, the person who wants to use this to 
better their business, better their processes, better their employees, earn a reasonable living, reasonable profit, and yet you've got all these people on the outside attacking you, attacking your customers. What, what's being done to make that a hard wall with that same technology being able to block bad people using the technology? From a service perspective, I think AI-enabled spam filtering, which I think Greg has a, a, a solution on that, um, because 90% of all attacks come in via email because it's the easiest way to get a hold of you, right? Uh, we can't shut off our email to do business. So if the hackers can get and as you saw, like the phishing examples, you're going to have more and more of those that are highly targeted attacks with the attack coming directly from an AI enabled bot that no human ever looked at it. But it looks really, really good. Um, so from that, that side, now from a regulatory perspective, like uh, I've done talks with FBI agents and like the bet. The best way you can do, for lack of better words, they are powerless. There isn't much they can do. Like they want you to submit it to the FBI registry, right? And they'll give you a call. And if they happen to have the de-encryption key, they'll give it to you, right? That's about the limit, but rarely do they have the de-encryption key uh, from, from like a ransomware perspective. So, and there just isn't a lot you can do because I know we all like the uh, Liam Neeson where I'm going to find you. I'm going to, you know, all that type of stuff, right? The truth is they're hacking you from someone else's computer that they hacked. So when you find them, you're just going to find another victim. And they've, t they've uh, scorched earth the whole network already. So there's no logs. There's no nothing anymore to go and find them anymore. And that's if you can get there. I assure you right now with uh, our relationship with Vladimir Putin, he's not too excited to have our FBI like, hey, we see one of these guys hacking over there. Can we come and uh, look at his computer network? He's just not rolling out the red carpet for us anymore. So these companies, uh, you do the same thing with China and North Korea. They are, in essence, protecting their uh, hackers. Because as long as they don't hack um, uh, their country, and again, if you're in Russia, I won't attack anyone. <laughs> I see what happened in there, right? So, and, so but attacking Europe, attacking you know US, they're going to be fine with that. Now, it's not an official policy, but they're going to have legal immunity for the most part because... That the Russian just wouldn't care. I'm just picking on Russia, but you take any of these type of countries that are uh, outside of the United States, if we don't have good diplomatic relations with those countries, they're not really going to do much to help us per, uh, catch those. And that's only if you could find them. Most of the time, you're going to be finding someone else's hacked network. So I think the... These are all the, after the fact. Yeah. The, the responsibility of protection really falls on us. That there isn't much anyone else can do. We are the ones that need to go ahead and protect our data, be knowledgeable of, all right, what is out there for a minute? Oh, did I move this somehow? Yeah. What is out there right now from an uh, AI capability perspective? Because if I started out this talk saying, hey, you need to make sure that you have a policy that uh, people don't listen to you from an employee perspective, most CEOs would be like, nah, it's probably not going to happen, right? But if I can show you videos, they're like, hey, here's the technology on how they can pretend to be you. This is why you need to go ahead and add these uh, policies and procedures in place. Then it becomes like, all right, I can see that now. So I think educating yourself and educating your employees on these are the attacks that are out there. They, these are why I'm setting this up there and why if I call you and tell you to do something, you need to not do it. Because if they go in, so does that make, make sense? Does that answer your question? Oh, a little bit, but it leads to my follow-up question. All right. And if all of this uh, is happening now and there's no stopping the bad guys from attacking the good guys, what's to stop Skynet from happening? Skynet is happening, ironically enough. Uh, so China uh, is deploying a system. Uh, they have a digital camera system there. They have logged every citizen within China, and they give them a social credit score. So basically how good of a Communist Party supporter they are. And there's places in China that if you don't have a high enough uh, social credit score, you can't walk into that place. And uh, My Skynet scenario was more Terminator-based. Oh, all right, Terminator-based. Well, the U.S. government just um, had an AI installed into one of their jets and did dogfighting against yeah. a, a real pilot. Uh, they didn't release who won, but that just happened uh, recently where they released that information. Uh, so that, that kind of stuff is happening. And, and there's, there's AI tools that we can put on a lot of these to kind of just firewall different segments of the network. So, for example, he was running talking about running scripts. Uh, we can say, okay, well, your Microsoft Office software can't run scripts. So if you download something, you click on this link, that it just has the inability to do that. So no matter what you do, and then of course you get, you know, have to call the help desk, hey, what's going on with this? 
And then we find out, oh, this was a malicious link or maybe it was legitimate and we let it go through whatever was going on. But, but we have to put some kind of physical eyeballs on that so we can validate that. Um, oh, the, the, uh, one, some of the other tools we use, which is this manage detection and response, which is AI tools that are watching for behavior type. So do you do this kind of thing all the time? And if the answer is no, then I think that's suspicious. And now I'm going to do something else. So these tools that we're talking about, and the AI and hackers and whatnot, they're going to be doing things that are more network administration types of tasks. But if you're not normally doing that, well, then we're going to look at that and say, okay, well, let's put some human eyes on that and, and see if this is legitimate or not. The only way I caught a hacker in business was uh, I got an email from my the owner of the company, who's my boss, asking to give me gift cards, iPad gift cards or Apple gift cards. Mm -hmm. I knew he didn't use Apple. <laughs> no, and, but but just like you were saying, you know, when you minute the minute you get a, a, an email like that, I gotta do that. Yeah. You know, I gotta go take care of these employees for him. And uh, it was after a few minutes and thinking, and I'm like, oh, David. Apple cards. I don't even know if David would even know what to do with Apple cards. <laughs> Am I getting Apple cards? And I called him, and yeah, it was uh, it was not a legitimate. We we had been hacked. Yeah, I've done security assessments where I'm sitting there with the CEO, and the CFO walks in like, "All right, here's those cards you wanted," and he's like, "My wh what?" Yeah. And I'm like, the minute he said that, I'm like, oh, "You just took a picture of those and sent it to him, didn't you?" He's like, "Yeah, he told me to." Yeah. So we had that exact thing happened one time my, my business partner it's very much like him to ask one of our marketing ladies to i'm going to see a customer yeah. you know take them a gift or whatever and it was about five thousand dollars that they got unfortunately there's a plug for american express they gave us all the money back right but that yeah that happened we had the gift card thing too as well i, I had it on her first day a couple years ago she got an email just like that from the owner, but it was Target gift cards. So she actually went and got them. And then once she realized their response was, let me have all the codes on the back. Yeah. She said, oh, wait. wait. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yep. This leads to a side point I wasn't going to make, I guess, but it like opening it up to other business leaders about what is happening in your business from a hack perspective, because getting hacked comes with a very negative connotation, right? Like I'm insufficient. I'm not good enough. And if we can just talk about those openly, like, I, hey, we bought these gift cards, that happens. Yeah, we got ransomware or we got our email breach. Here's what we did to protect that. We'll take away the stigma of getting hacked and then also educate. Because I, I can tell you, Greg, I and uh, Rick, we get calls almost every week from clients that are getting hacked. And again, someone was like, well, I'm not deploying multi-factor. I'm like, all right. And then two weeks later, they call me like, yeah, we'll take that multi-factor. I'm like, oh, you got hacked, huh? So hey, we don't laugh at it, at least in front of the customer. But uh, um, uh, <laughs> but again, a lot of what we're doing is more education than tech-based because there's things that we can do to fix and solve all these type of things, but some of it costs more money, right? Upgrading your 365 license and enable Intune or uh, getting you know, multi-factor, and then you have to train these employees. Like, what do you mean I have to look at a separate code on to log into my email or you know, what do you mean everyone at the company can't use the same login? <laughs> you know, these are, but anyway, so. So wouldn't you agree though that basically there's kind of two categories of problem. One is actual infiltration through, you know, like breaking into your house and the other is social engineering, which is phishing emails and so on, et cetera. And AI is actually just speeding up all the different ways that those two things can happen. But attacking that, that's just totally reactionary. It's like, oh yeah, there's a new scam this way and there's emails that say this and so on and so on. But the prevention is more on the social engineering. It's just education. It's like, be smart, not, well, you need to know all the different scams that happen so that when it comes to you, you'll recognize it. It's like, hey, how do you be smart so you don't get duped? <laughs> and likewise, on the infiltration side, that's that's hardware, software. That's what he was talking about, you know, how backdoors on the network and so on, which, you know, there's those two categories. That's the that's where the prevention needs to happen. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Uh, 
The only thing I would probably say to that is that it's not necessarily be smart because a, a smart employee will do what their boss tells them to do, right? Well, unless, unless an employee has been educated that these type of things can happen, right? Because if the employee, I can tell you the average American has no idea that you can fully emulate someone's voice and video. They, just, they don't even know that's even possible. Now, those of us in the tech world might be like, well, yeah, of course that's possible. It's common sense to us. But I mean, I have team members at my own and we're a cybersecurity company. I do a lot of training that had no idea that you could emulate video and such until I go and teach them that, hey, this is why I'm telling you, you can't do these type of things. So it is education, but you have to, you can only be smart with the things be you know. smart is to, okay, somebody asks you to do something, there's a way to validate that. That's to be smart because there's no way you can keep up with what all the requests are going to be and how good they're going to be. Yeah. So unless, uh, unless somebody is in your face and you know it's them and they're asking you to go do something, there needs to be a validation mechanism so that no matter how outlandish or how good these requests can be, and that's what's going to actually evolve, that there is a way, there's a fail-safe that's built in. So yeah, there is a way to validate the request from your CEO. That's what I'm talking about. That's the right prevention is not each of these individual cases. It's let's build a mechanism so that it doesn't matter what those cases are, they can't happen. Yeah, that's, and that's like having a double check. So if I'm going to write a, a $2,000 check or a $20,000 check that maybe I have authorization to do X amount of dollars, but then beyond that, I need a second set of you know, someone else to validate that. And, and that just goes back to your training and policies and procedures of how you conduct business in general. Uh, I, I agree with, with that is the non-tech solution to a lot of this. But, but I can tell you also, there are, I would bet you nine out of 10 businesses are not set up with that level of uh, policy and procedureing. And that's from someone that does a lot of assessments, both AI assessments and security assessments with companies. Uh, I, I, nine out of 10 might even be high as far, I mean, it might even be higher than that. I mean, so... You are correct, but that isn't what most businesses are doing. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Is that the, the proper approach or the best practice approach to prevention is to look at it from that side, not to look at all the different things that could happen. But look at this event here. How many people did you invite today? Uh, probably four or five hundred. It's be, and it's people people be, aren't, it's aren't taking because, it serious. They don't understand. But the and the education should be about what the actual impact can be if you get hacked, right? So that's what people don't realize. They hear, oh, somebody's got hacked. Like, oh, someone they they stole a thousand dollars in gift cards from us, and so on. If they get into your system and they steal your whole customer list, and then they start attacking your customer list, guess what? You're going to go bankrupt because your customers are going to come after you. But hard. not you and your business, right? Because you didn't Because you were here today. You didn't prevent <laughs> All the, other the attack on yourself <laughs> that led to the problem for them. So that that's the, the people, business people need to understand what the actual impact can be. Not, oh, I can lose a thousand dollars. It could kill their business. Like, right. I think there's a lot of ways that can happen as well. So. With ransomware, which we bump into fairly often, yeah. that um, if your systems are frozen, you've designed your business. No longer how, no matter how long you've been in business, yeah. you designed it using computers. If they're just you know paperweights now for a week, you don't have the people to manage your business. You don't have you don't have as many bookkeepers as you all had twenty years ago, or any of that stuff. So it just comes to a grinding halt, and all of a sudden you're just bleeding money. And just because you pay the ransom doesn't mean you're going to get your data back. That just means you're going to spend some more money. Yeah. And so I think prevention is really, education is really important. But when you're having these conversations with Greg and about what tools you're using, what tools he's using, you know, a couple bucks a user here, a couple bucks, you know, it all adds up to real money. And I know it's your money, but be smart about it and understand that you're, you're really trying to solve much bigger problems than, you know, that if it's recommended, it's, it's not a, I know the margins in the business for these kinds of tools and they're not great. So Gray's not retiring because he's putting a better anti-spam filter on your, on your emails. It's just, you know, if you know, ask Greg what he's doing with his email and, and follow what he's doing, because he's doing it because he's scared about his business too. And I, we do the same thing in, you know, in our business. So.
Yeah. Any other questions or? Uh... Well, now I need some audience feedback. So audience, what do you want help to see how to do? Challenge me. From a security? No, no, from anything. No, no, no. More specifically, let's say there's something that uh, you want to even see. So an example I have, uh, I was at, uh, speaking with one of my clients once, and she works at a behavioral health clinic that has uh, treatment for um, like drug addicts and stuff like that. So one of the things that she uses for was to, this, this, they had one of their patients that was driving from one city to the other, right? It was about a six hour drive. Well, she used Bing Chat over here to look for AA meetings along that path. They were leaving at eight o'clock and find AA meetings that would be about the area where that person was. And it found a whole list of them in the towns that there's like two hours away. This one's happened at 10 o'clock, go another two hours. This one's in this city at noon and was able to give that patient one to make sure that they can stay on their AA meetings. So from your guys' specific industries as a whole, we'll probably try keeping this to text and video. But one of the things I can show you right here is... So I don't, know, I don't know if you noticed from the uh, AI built that first slide that I had that you guys are all looking at. So I was like, I'm talking in Houston. I hear you guys are, know a thing or two about oil. I want to connect it to AI. So I have an AI oil well that popped up. And I didn't have to pay any royalties for it. It just uh, connected well. You haven't created a, a webinar for yourself or in Zora with your own likeness? I haven't yet. So one one thing I was I was telling Hope uh, that one thing I did with this recently is I'm uh, I'm currently reading the book uh, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham talks about you know stock investing and how to pick stocks kind of like Warren Buffett does so I, I was just very interested in that and uh, what I asked ChatGPT to do was to give me the formulas themselves not the principles not the how tos of of how this works so first it started showing me. The, the actual formulas that it uses that Benjamin Graham was recommending in, in different metrics. And then what I did is I took uh, some screenshots from E-Trade of some stocks and I said, hey, I want you to analyze this. Does this fall into this formula for that? And it told me at first that it didn't have enough information. So then I went and got more information from E-Trade and I pumped it back into, into it. And these were screenshots that it was reading, not a text. And then it, it found the information on each screenshot and then was able to tell me if that stock was a good pick based off the Benjamin Graham Sonera formulas. The next thing I asked it to do is I said, great, thank you very much. Can you build me an Excel sheet that uh, will calculate this out for me? And please point out where in the screenshots you got that information. Like, you know, because I don't know what I'm doing. So it went off to the screenshots, found, says, hey, you, you get the, the, the P&E ratio from here. You get the, you know, all the different values that it's talking about. And then I could populate that Excel sheet. So I thought that was a really cool thing. Now, when, and when I first looked at the Excel sheet, it was wrong and it had some issues. So this isn't perfect yet, uh, absolutely. But so it goes to, to just, just like the, there was a, a lawyer example you mentioned that, uh, that we were talking about earlier that uh, not Michael Cohen, Michael Avenatti uh, had used AI for some court cases uh, against Trump and happened to leave all of the citations which were wrong. So anytime you're doing this, you need to validate the data and make sure that it's correct. But as it's getting smarter every day, it's it's getting these examples better for you. Yeah, like so for that book, I asked him to relate it to the specific IT industry and how could I apply that? So we could try this again. Uh, give me one of the industries you, I, you guys are in. Any industry at all. Locksmith, how about that? All right. <laughs> Could you relate it to physical security and with a locksmith? What takeaways or practical applications could apply? So I'm going to highlight something too. Notice how you have two red squigglies on there, right? My spelling is atrocious, all right? If you ever get an actual email written by me, it's not good, right? AI doesn't care. So it knows what I was asking. <laughs> Talking about Benjamin Graham still. Yeah, because I told it up there. So it's still in context of the Benjamin Graham one, right? So now it's going to apply all those concepts to So in locksmithing, a lot of times when I'm speaking, if it's at a trade show or a uh, um, industry show, like I've talked to behavioral health specialists or government employees or um, HR employees, I will ask AI, hey, I'm going to talk to them. Could you explain to me 
explain to a room of HR executives how AI works. And then it will go give analogies of what they do in their regular job versus then connect that to AI specifically. I've done that with behavioral health. It told me about cognitive behavior therapy, which I had no idea what that was, but it made sense to all the room I was talking to. And they're like, oh, right. I'm like, yeah, I'm really smart, you know? No, I told them that AI built it, but. So here's a crown. So rather than having to read a whole book, I can just tell it the book I want I'm reading and summarize it and how would I actually use this? Tell it to write you a script for conversational AI sales for IT assessments. Could you write me a single page application? Oh, you mean like a Word script, not a software like script, a sales right? Sales script, yeah. All hey, right, all right, all right. For my conversational AI bot to call and sell you Craig services. I'm going to use Sonnet here. Sonnet's really quick. Um, and just slightly below chat GPT four, but for that type of thing, I think it'd be fine. Could you write me a script so I could call and set an appointment with a small business of 20 computers in the Houston, Texas market. I want to set a Cyber security assessment. Output the entire script. I'll zoom that in so you guys can read that a little bit. You guys read that? So here she is. Good morning, my name is Rod, and I am calling your company name. We specialize in providing comprehensive cybersecurity assessments and solution. So then it pitches, I understand today's business, uh, protecting uh, your business from cyber liabilities. So I might go read this and like, that sounds awful salesman -y, right? So I'm like, could you help me with a pitch that might get me past the gatekeeper and uh, doesn't sound uh, salesy. That's the official spelling of salesy. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So hi, my name is uh, a small business owner myself. I understand the importance of safeguarding your computer data. That was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not here to sell you anything. Yeah, <laughs> how to tell a salesman, right? All right, we're gonna try this again. It'll, it'll, it'll keep trying because at the end of the day, AI is just, just this insane data mining, right? Absolutely. Bringing it all together. This would never happen. This would never work 30 years ago. Yeah. Because the background, the information, all the data wasn't there, right? So oh. now I can go in and find all of this stuff and put two and two together because of the history and the info, right? It also has a treasure trove of information with the internet and YouTube and all of those different places where people are storing stuff. So, I, I you know, one of the things... I think we really want to get out of this and, and I'm seeing it. I just don't know how to put it together. It's like with, with Ashley and her team, you know, we use a couple of different platforms from auto posts and then, and then of course Salesforce, which we've mm. essentially turned into our SAP uh, with the modifications we've done to it. And how do we, um, how do we set uh, accountables and measurables for her team uh, within those, those platforms? And, and do you I'm say sure that again? Some way, somehow, How do, do I that. create accountability? And that, that was with Salesforce. What was the other one? Uh, auto quotes. Auto quotes. Accountability and measurables. So both of those platforms. And auto quote, you said? S Salesforce does. I'm not sure about auto quote, but you, we may want to look in to see what kind of what they refer to as API access. So that's back end access into their software. From that, we could set up some kind of a tool with ChatGPT or, or Claude or whatever 
that would get the information that you want and then massage it how you want it to, to be, you know, I'm trying to get reporting data, I'm trying to get customer sentiment data, I'm trying to get whatever, and then maybe we could pump it into one of the other systems or, or get, you know, from both so that you get visibility that you're, what your, your objective is that you're trying to get out of it. And what we could do is we could take sample data and then give it a sample result and say, okay, well, how would I build this out? What's the workflow that we want? What's, uh, where, where are the sources coming from? So in the quoting system, it's coming from uh, you know, the quote itself. Well, in Salesforce, I've got all my customer data. So let's talk about APIs right there. This thing is not stopping. <laughs> it keeps going. Yeah, I'll zoom out a little bit here because while you guys were talking, so here is a script that will take your Salesforce data and allow you to export it like Greg was asking for. Uh, you'd have to put your own uh, instance and API key in there. But then this script would export your data for you. And then you could actually use this to build it, say, hey, I want to how many calls per hour or measurables you probably have defined. You just don't know how to get it out of those systems. And a script like this, uh, normally get a Salesforce uh, developer is about 350 to 450 an hour is uh, the going rate for a Salesforce one. So here you got it almost immediately. Now you'd want to create the API key so it does read only, of course, and do some security protections on it to me. Make sure that if this key was ever compromised, it's limited in the type of data that you'd get from that. But um, like the, this here is how I built that one tool I showed that I did three at a time. Our funny story on that application is uh, I asked our head developer, like, look, I don't want to build up a whole instance here. Can you just find me some single application that allows me to get, uh, do all this stuff, right? He's like, sure, I've never used this one. This one looks good. So we tried it and we could do our permissions, stuff like that. However, this morning I found out that all my instances were public, which uh, my API keys were also public with it. Now again, we had the proper protections from their read-only keys and stuff, so my max exposure was like $20 of uh, token credits from those different particular s systems. But I went in because I was gonna be like, oh yeah, let's, go to these. let's let everyone play around with it. I'm like, why is all my files gone? Well, yeah, there was a, we were able to actually log into it without any credentials or log in and stuff. I'm like, hmm, that's good to know. I'm glad I didn't do anything important in there. Mm -hmm. So. If you're working with systems like this, and you're going to see that more from an AI perspective, that this makes things easy to do. But that also means that, because even when I was writing my first code, my head software guy came up there like, well, yeah, that's good and all, but your API keys are on the open. It took him like two seconds to find them, right? Just from a standard website. I'm like, oh, so I don't want that. And he's like, no, Rod, no. But it empowers people who are not skilled at that uh, profession to perform and do the job of someone who is. So the all, all that to say is that this will empower you to do a lot of things, but it'd still be good to talk to someone that knows what they're doing. So that way you don't do what you, you can do it, but there's one thing to do it, but then do it in a way that doesn't give hackers all your data. But, so on that note, this here, you, and for what I found with Claude, Claude is what I use if I'm doing software dev, I haven't done a lot of software dev with OpenAI's ChatGPT4, though they released a new update about two weeks ago that from both the metrics are saying that it's on par with, uh, with what Claude can do. And one of the biggest reasons for that is uh, what's called a needle in a haystack test. Now, without getting, well, I'm gonna get geeky. We're in the workshop part, so. So let's go needle in haystack. Uh, chat GPT. All right, so this one here, this is a better representation of it. So this one's called a needle in a haystack test. Uh, and I'm not gonna go, so this here each represents, let's say you put in a giant file, right? Let's say you put 10,000 numbers inside a, one of these APIs. And you go and ask it for a random number or text or word, how often is it able to find that? That is not a very good needle and haystack result, right? Because that's showing about 50 to 60% of the time it comes back with the incorrect data, which if you're doing analysis, you can't work correctly with 60% uh, accuracy because you need to have multiple sets that go on top of it. And from a software development perspective, if you're referencing uh, readme docs or specs or diagrams, you need it to be almost 100%, otherwise you're gonna put the wrong values in the wrong characters and your code isn't gonna work. However, with Claude, let's do Claude. Claude three is probably will come up. Do Claude three. 
This here was its Claude three opus specifically. This here is its needle and haystack finding. So a lot more greens in there, right? And this offer multiple, multiple tests, but it's closer to a 99%. So that means that 99% of the time, the code that you're going to run is actually accurate. It has the correct functions. And a lot of times when I wrote software with Claude, if it's doing the wrong stuff, it's because there's six months ago, that's what the framework supported. They've released an update from back then to now. And the framework from today doesn't use the same variables. I just go copy and paste a readme document into Claude. And then it's like, oh, I see, it changes it and it works. So anyway, so this here would be one way of solving that particular problem. And here, I'll go and ask uh, ChatGPT the same thing. ChatGPT is just in general slower, which is why I've started to use Claude. Now ChatGPT can make images and fun stuff like that, but oh, that's not what I want. Saying very similar things though. Oh, there we go. So it's structured a little bit in there, but there it has your authentication token for Salesforce and it's writing you some Python script and it's querying the database. So this wrote in two separate files. I like it in one file, but that's probably a more accurate way to do it if you're building a much larger app. But if you're just doing individual dashboarding, that might be a decent way of, of getting that. Or you could ask it to, could you output the code as a single file that will run from my desktop and put the data in a CSV once downloaded or queried? Also, Claude has a uh, 200,000 token limit. Uh, ChatGPT has 128,000 token limit. I'll explain what a token limit is in a second. So 128,000 is about 300 pages of written text, uh, full, you know, no spaces, no nothing, about 300 pages. Whereas Claude has the ability to do 200,000, so about 600 pages. Gemini 1.5 does a million tokens, which a million tokens, again, is almost, what's that scale up to? Uh, 3,600 pages. And that's without space or anything, that's just straight up pages of text. Uh, and that's custom data that you can utilize. That isn't, it still has its own giant repository of information, but it's stuff that you specifically can do. That's how the API charges you. They charge you based on your token usage. All right, so yeah, here it wrote a single file. It does all these type of things. It's gonna ask me for a token eventually in here. It's, yeah, it hits this inside of here. Then it also gives you, one of the things I like about, and these AI just started doing this about six months ago, they actually tell you how to set up your server environments uh, so you can actually run these things, like a pip install request command. Now let's say you might be like, I have no idea what a pip is, right? Well, you just say, tell it. Uh, I have no idea what a pip is. How do I use this? So it'll walk you through and answer every one of your questions. There's nowhere here. First install, go to download, do a download it from python.org, install Python, add it to your path. If you want to do it on a Mac, here's how you do it on a Windows, a Mac, or a Linux computer. Install pip. It tells you go download. It's going to go down, open a command line. And some of you might be, I don't know how to open a command line. So you know what you do? You go tell it, I don't know what a command line is. How do I do that? And then it will tell you how to do that. So then it goes and uh, walks you step by step, the one step in that process that you didn't know how to do. And you can keep doing that on every step of the process. So if it ever summarizes something like, whoa, 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 let's downgrade it a little bit here, right? I'm not a 20 year software dev. It does it. And me being able to do this is what convinced my brother, who's a 20 year software dev, that AI actually has potential because he, he knows I, I've been on this AI train here for about three years telling him how awesome it is and stuff. He's like, Rod, I ain't drinking that Kool-Aid here. I'm a he's super geeky engineer, wonderful guy. Everyone likes him more than they like me. But he's not, uh, um, he's, he doesn't do any fluff, you know? He's just, you know, he's straight and narrow. Everything is this way. When I was able to start getting these programs working, he's looking at the code. He's like, boy, that's a, if we hired an employee that was writing that code, I would, I'd accept that. That's good. That got him over the, from a belief perspective that, 
this AI stuff really is a future. And since he did it, now I have a 20 year developer doing five times the code he used to. You know, with the integration of Copilot into Office, <clears throat> you know, if you're if you're struggling with, let's say, trying to come up with Excel formulas, for example, you know, you could talk to it and say, hey, I want to do this kind of formula, whatever that is. I want to do some kind of lookup. I want to do just a, a, a sum or an average. And let's say that someone doesn't know how to do that kind of thing. You could ask it and it would tell you how to do it. Oh, fine. Turn on auto save. Sure, yeah, we can go. We can show some Copilot here. Any second? There we go. All right. Uh, try example. All right. So it gave me a bunch of example data. So I could say, could you give me a formula in J10? What on earth? In J10 that um, sums the data in column G. We'll see if this does it. So Copilot was really released about three months ago into the product suite. It's gotten significantly better since then in each of the applications. It's not a, a home run hitter yet, in my opinion. It will be, and I see the progress they're making every all the time. So yeah, there it gave me the formula. It didn't insert it directly into it. Like, can you insert it into J10. So you can see it can do it. It's It gave me the formula up there for equal sum GG, right? That's how you create that formula. I don't know if you can see that, but it's right here. All right, no. So they haven't developed it yet where it can actually interact directly into there, but it can help me with the formulas that I'm looking for and it can read the data that's in there. So I would guess in the next couple months, you're gonna have that. Like Greg was talking about Copilot from a software developer perspective. One of the applications we use, it was the Copilot, uh, for software development, we switched over to one called Cursor, uh, Cursor AI, uh, and Cursor AI actually will insert all the code changes directly into the code and then treats it as a code review where you just review it and then either approve or deny it from that perspective. That is where we've gained a lot of the speed perspective. So it took the stuff that you could copy and paste it over into any of these AIs and it would go ahead and change it, but then you have to go actually implement it. Well, uh, Cursor AI and all these AIs, especially 365 Copilot, are working towards doing the direct insertion into the product line themselves. They're just not quite there from a development perspective. And even a company the size of Microsoft being able to get this product actually deployed from nothing to where it's actually usable in the course of a year, for them, that's moving light speed. You know, and uh, seeing month over month improvement into it, companies that size do not move that quickly. So they, I can give them props for they're trying, right? They're trying, but. All right, let's go to the next example. What was something that we'd like to see? You got anything? Well, that's in, I mean, uh, I guess can you, when you want to show them a zap on how to trigger something? I don't have zap logged in. But so z what Zap does is it'll allow you to integrate multiple applications together. The, these programs can actually build your integration for you, so you don't even need Zap if you didn't want. You need Zap here? No, you could go ahead and build the straight up uh, integration. Like everything that we've ever wanted to integrate, we just build the. We have. I say, I do. My brother again. My brother would say, No, no. There's different ways of doing this, Rod. <laughs> so uh, I'll speak for myself, right? Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm hitting your mic. I'll stop that. Uh, uh, I can go. So. What's two apps you'd want to integrate together? So, for example, my gentleman is talking about uh, Salesforce. He wants to uh, have that on the first of the month to he enters whatever KPIs he wants and he wants to run a report. I mean, what do you what, what kind of report would you want on the first? Well, of the when, month? It comes to, when it comes to a report, we're, we're, we're solid on that stuff. It, it's, is it's, it automated? Uh, yeah, very much yeah. so. Okay. Very much so. Um, now, there's some there's some other. There's some things that we don't know. We don't necessarily know what we want, so we're looking for <laughs> outlets to, to give us ideas to understand what we want, and then from there, then you can go figure out how to how to build and make them. 
Yeah, so what I would encourage you to do then is uh, set up a little test environment, almost treat it as your research and development that you can go ahead and at least find close to what you're looking for. And if you have a dev team or a dev team you work at, you work with, you could go ahead and have them connected so that way they get you your, either build yourself what's called REST APIs, so that way you can hit those APIs and give you documentation for those. And then just copy and paste those APIs into this application. And then, then from there, uh, it can put code that you can execute directly from your desktop. So for, uh, it would go touch the, and use this to go ahead and create a computer. I probably wouldn't do it on like your, uh, your one you're doing all your main business on, but set up a separate computer. That won't happen. All right. I'm not setting up anything. That's what these guys are for. <laughs> all right, you, all right. Are you familiar with Zoom Info? <laughs> we're gonna figure yeah. out what we need huh? and then we're going. Yeah. Okay, can you do something on, on the level of a Zoom Info? But, but what I'm seeing here is that you can type anything in. So from a standpoint of going to the boardroom, putting the, putting the big screen up and just having a brainstorming session and just spitballing ideas, what is, what is going to come out of that is going to be, there's going to be so much that, that we're going to draw off of that that will help us build upon just initial thoughts, ideas. You're going to have some fears that you're going to have to deal with too, though. I'm sure. People are going to be concerned about, well, if I give you all my ideas and you automate me, then you turn five into one, and that's the legitimate, what's or, going to happen. You're going to do the work of... Bigger, to be a much bigger mm -hmm. company with... The there you go. That's the other, other way, I guess. Right. I mean, you can use this to research things like give me some use cases that people are using, you know, to automate Salesforce right. in my industry or in you know, similar industries, and it'll do a pretty good list to, yeah. like, you know, give you some ideas. Yeah. So let's do this, yeah. Could you give me some ideas for, and it was food equipment, right? Food equipment sales? And something you could do if you wanted to is take a list of your existing products, export to CSV and just paste it into here. So therefore, then you can say, hey, these are the type of products that we sell right now. What are auxiliary products that you would recommend I could go sell? Or what are some uh, good services I could do with that? I imagine from a standpoint of, of, of market research, could be endless here. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the AI models don't have up-to-date data, but they will have something that's a little older that you could work with. But uh, like for a while, ChatGPT was limited to 2021 data. And so then they opened it up and they downloaded more stuff. So it just kind of depends. But so you'll have to ask it, hey, how up to date are you on whatever we're trying to research? Oh, it did residential food equipment sales. So this gets into the prompt engineering side of it that a lot of what you're doing here, you just need to play with uh, the prompts that you're using, see what you get and find the type of prompts that describe what you're looking for. In fact, 99% of all of this is prompt engineering. I spend far more of my time as, from an automation perspective, trying to properly describe to the AI what I'm looking for. And something I might do is uh, I use AI to help me with that. Like, I am in the professional food equipment industry. Could you give me a prompt that would help refine my search? And this may seem counterintuitive, right? However, if you go back to that one slide where I talked about that, the AI can't do multi-step. So here it can do this one step. Yeah, I can give you a prompt that goes ahead that would work well for me. Well, then you copy and paste that prompt back into itself and all of a sudden you're on step two, right? So you basically from a project manager side, you, you would define your steps that until the AI get caught up and can do multi-prompt realize like, oh, that's the type of stuff that's where let me do this multi-step thing. Or as AI agents, which uh, is a different talk in itself, but become more prevalent within the marketplace that you'll have project management or customer service or development agents that have predefined prompt engineered. So one thing we're really looking for as well is, is some, some, some AI technology when we get different reports from our, our different principals, our factories, that we can scan into our system and it goes where it needs to go within our our sales force or, or, or accounting environment. We get different reports from every different manufacturer we work with. So finding a common piece that will we'll pull that together so far, we haven't found anything that can do it. 
So I'm not going to show it on here because this is recorded. But uh, we have so at Cooley Tech, every just like uh, Greg and Rick, uh, when we get when you guys as clients email us support requests, every one of those requests are different, right? I mean, they just look different. They but the AI is able to scrub each one of those, and uh, from my testing anyway, I'd, I'd put it at a 99% accuracy of correctly. Hey, this is an email account. These are the tags that should go on it. This one here has a server down. Let's go ahead and escalate to the critical. And uh, but it does come to I, I have a prompt that's about this long that says, Hey, this is the data. Here's what each of these data points mean. Here's the categories. Here's what the categories mean. Uh, when you see this, I want you to get three outputs. I want you to tell me what do you summarize in your own words what you think this is. Um, here, throw these tags on it and give me a list of actions that need to happen based off this. And I don't tell what actions are available. I just tell it based off its AI capability, this is the actions that I want you to. So it, then that information go right into the ticket so that way when my tier ones get that, they're like, all right, so if it's an email user, I have a team that can just go handle that. If it's server down, obviously that's gonna go to my tier twos, tier threes, and they're gonna realize that that's a critical, gonna get escalated properly. Um, <clears throat> so how you would get to that point is start taking some of those reports and paste them right into Claude. Now, what you'll want to make sure is that the data you're putting inside there is not what you'd call sensitive information. So if it ended up out in the public through some uh, breach, no, see, that's, that's where we'd have to figure that out because what, what we want to do is, you know, we're, we're, we've engaged a, a, uh, a third party organization back office to where we can take our, our, all of our stuff that needs to be our, our data entry items from purchase orders, invoices, that type of stuff, so that our folks aren't actually doing it. Where that can be done at night or on the weekends or some other time where we can do all of the customer facing work. But if we were to get purchase orders or we get invoices in that we can just run that through the system, it picks up what it needs to pick up and it recognizes whether it's an invoice number, a purchase order number, an order number, one of those can get inside our system and say, okay, I can match it up to here. Now I can recognize the number and, and, and input all of that additional information that we need in there versus us having to do the data entry. And then if there's any issues that pop up next morning, there's an email that says, we did this overnight. If there's an issue with this one, this one, this that we now need to check. The amount of time that that would save us, it wouldn't reduce people. It would allow us to grow as an organization and to take on more business because I don't need to go hire five other people to spend time on stuff that doesn't make money. Mm -hmm. it, it costs money. Yeah, that that is very similar to what I'm talking about. So like when, if you email, let's say you email Greg, right, for support. Well, you might already have a ticket open for that, but you might have not put the ticket number inside of it. So you need to go look at the person's account. What open tickets do they have? Does this from that same person? Basically a lot of, undefinable aspects of it because that could be a new ticket response or that should be tied to the existing ticket. AI does a good job of filling in those gaps and making those determinations. Um, where, so if AI does, if AI can do that and the data points you're talking about are not complicated. So you'd have a, with your Salesforce or your accounting system, you'd want to do some type of API connection. Like, hey, these are the Salesforce number or quote numbers or whatever that are out there right now. And these are the customers associated to it. And if you want, if you're concerned about the data, you could depersonalize the data. So you put it as a code instead of the actual name of it. Then you pay it. But like the Claude model, for example, is one of the first ones that allow you to do a uh, secure enterprise solution where it's still, it's not out in the open. It's within a private repo as a whole. So, but, uh, so you would be able to do that from now. It'd be some dev time to do that. It's not something that it does off the shelf and you still need to define well, how do I map these data? Then test it and you know experiment with it a little bit. But if you found someone in your organization that had a fascination with AI, they could probably they would probably enjoy the opportunity of trying to get it so that way it maps all this data. Then you just take a dev who can go ahead and get you the raw data points, and then through prompt engineering, eventually you'll come up with a prompt like, "Hey, this thing works most of the time. Let's go ahead and roll it out to see how it works on everything." Because if you're talking five employees, that's about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year savings. You know, so if you can have two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year savings. And you gain the experience to apply that to other areas within your uh, enterprise that, hey, this, this is one use case that worked really, really well. Let's go ahead and find where else I can use this. And you already have then team members that are AI ready that they, they see it and it builds. So if you go do that and you don't fire anyone as a result of it, 
you get to use that as an excuse. Like, look, we're automating, we're growing, we're innovating, we're not firing. Let's go ahead and automate. Every, like at my company, it took me a number of years to get everyone on board with the idea that, yeah, we're going to go and automate everything. We're going to use AI and everything. And I'm not going to fire you. If we end up making a lot of money and playing video games all day and all our customers are happy, I don't care. Right? As long as, as, long as everything's going good. If I'm not getting yelled at by my, comp- by my customers and they're super happy, I'm happy at the end of the day. So... But that's more than I could demo in this uh, this talk here. So, I, so I think I think the first step would be to to identify those emails mm. that are coming in, finding out what characteristics there are, and then we could we could funnel that into one of these AI models to say, okay, identify this particular email. Is it a PO? Is it a quote? Is a an order? Is it a what? Or is it just a question? And then try to see if we could filter that out for you. That'd be step one. And then two, what do you want to do with it next? Oh, I want to take the PO and order the equipment. Or I want to take the quote and uh, send a follow-up email. Uh, it's an order. Oh, that needs to go over to this person over here so that they can go buy the equipment or whatever. Right. Um, so, the, and that's where we're, we're looking to start. It's just all the data entry part of it, just for just to start. Then from there, when we actually get when we get uh, when we get orders come in, that we and we just keep going. We're almost every single bit of that is automated um, to the point to where. Now we're getting, uh, it's creating reports on top of those. Um, but we got to have somebody that can build it, somebody who, who can sit in our environment and it not cost $100,000 to put each one of these steps along the way because it is pretty labor intensive uh, from what we've seen to date. And that's where, you know, with, with, the, with AI, as fast as it's growing, Hopefully you give it enough, if we get enough information to get the thing started, it then is creating itself uh, on top and, uh, and moving forward. So we, we don't have to stop. We're in the business of, of, of selling food service equipment. We're not in the business of going to figure out how to process and, and, and um, take the people out and, and automate everything. So we, we need the who for that. Uh, and, and the who part of that understands the how, and the more people I have to have involved, the more who's I have, the more it is cost prohibitive to do that. So hopefully at some point the AI helps us get to where we need to go uh, within a reasonable cost and a reasonable amount of time so that we can go back to doing, we're not smart enough to do anything other than food service equipment. Yeah. Friars or something. <clears throat> so yeah. I went and found a random handwritten text from the internet, right? To just highlight the concept that the, the AI as of today can go ahead and read whatever format you got your paperwork from, right? And in my opinion, it did a pretty decent job. It interpreted the handwriting from that one fairly accurately, right? Here, I'll zoom that in a little bit. You guys don't have the value of seeing it from my screen. We'll zoom out just a little bit. That's pretty decent. So from an OCR perspective, uh, this here, if you had your invoices that came in and maybe you go through a cheaper one. Now this is using the Opus model. So a scan like that would probably cost maybe a quarter of a penny or something like that. So not atrocious, but I mean, uh, and as you get this, you can go get it to do your prompt engineering. Like I just said, can you give me the text of here? You could ask it, can you, uh, can you identify a PO, an SO, or whatever terms you're using from here? And you put, again, your prompt, what are the 10 different prompts that, or 10 different words that all your vendors are using for these things? So then you just categorize it from your multi-step, you move it to the next one, like, all right, this is a sales order, pull the data out of Salesforce or whatever here for uh, the number that we've identified. Are there any customers that have that? So you do that from an engineering perspective, but the, from a capability perspective, now this type, of, this type of technology is relatively new, right? Uh, now you can do, o- OCR is not new, but OCR and handwritten text that, now, they have better handwriting than myself, but you wouldn't want all your POs like that, right? Yeah, but I'm assuming this does OCR and context. Yeah. Simultaneously, which is the big problem with OCR is there's no context. 
I would, I would agree. And you can define as, yeah, you can tell it as contact. Like, so let's see if I can find just a straight up uh, sales order. Uh, handwritten sales order. Um, ooh. Wait, how much of a challenge do you want to give it? Oh, that one has a uh, copyrighted text on it. We don't want that one. That one's pretty good. I like that one. You get sales orders like that still? <laughs> All right. You know what? Let's just see how it does, right? So, once in a while, I run into like a HVAC person that's still doing this, but let's see. Can can you tell me the amount, the order number? And an itemized list of all items on this image for this sales. This year's kind of fun. Let's see how this works. Image shows an invoice from WVA Electric Company. Sales order number 8830. Total amount $17.56. Date was issued was the 1st of May of 1973. There's an itemized list of all the items that were put on that sales order. Now, you'd want this verified by a human, right? Especially one this ugly. But even if this was 80% accurate, you saved yourself 80% of time. A single person where you would have had one person to do it, or five people, for you, you might be able to do one person to do this. It even found a discrepancy in the math. Yeah. Yeah, well, it says the total listed amount is 19 bucks, but it's really 17 bucks. so... I don't necessarily want it to go into an Excel sheet. So if, if, a, if a customer, let's say a customer sends in a purchase order, we've already created a quote and auto quotes that is then attached to Salesforce that downloads all of the, the, the data into Salesforce of which we've already attached the customer, our sales rep, and for each one of our manufacturers that's within that project. We know what the, the commission splits and, and all, where all of that is going. It would be great we get to a point to where a PO comes in, somebody gets the email and hits submit on the PO. It goes into the system. It recognizes everything in the PO, who the PO submitter is, which of our factories it's going to. It's, it then goes and finds the project that's associated with the terms so maybe we quoted it at a thousand dollars and we negotiated and we're selling it for 750 it finds the notes within and then recognizes and justifies um, or reconciles the amounts if there's something that's not right sends a red flag and says i need a human to, to check this but if everything looks good sends that on to the manufacturer then here's where it'd be real cool now let's go dump it into SharePoint where we have our file share and, and the actual file for the project and then updates our checkpoints within the system. But right now to have one, per, how long does it take somebody to do a PO on average? Depends, it could be three to 10 minutes depending on factory. Three to 10 minutes and, and we're, and now where we're at in our business right now we're probably perch processing a good day could be 70 to 100 POs a day. That's that's a ton. And that doesn't even account for the POs that we don't get, that we then get an invoice dumped from our manufacturers, that now we don't need to process, it's already done. We just need to get it into our system because we don't know that the PO's been sent already, but now we have the invoice. So we need it in our system so we can we can run our reports properly so we can then, so our, our reps in our different departments get the credits that they need for the sale of the credit. So there's there's a lot there that, and my, my concern with an open or public system is we, 
we can't just open up chat GPT and start running all of our company through chat GPT. I don't believe we can. I and wouldn't. Maybe I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> However, so Claude is one that uh, if I'm set sure up properly. Would take over my business <laughs> very quickly. Yeah, Claude is one that if it was set up properly, I, I would feel comfortable with doing that. But it has to be the, a big distinction. It has to be set up properly. Yeah, yeah. So, the, you know, if there's something somewhere when, as this thing grows, if there was something that is internal. Right, you're going to you know, need a firewall of some sort to keep the information you're putting into it from right. getting out, right? Well, right. you have uh, 365, don't you? Yeah. So all that's cl already cloud data. Like it has Copilot built within it. Everything that we have, we've made it to where everything is in the cloud, with the exception of a couple of servers that are that run redundant information yeah. that's already in SharePoint, so that it's it's quicker in house graphs. Yep. So that's where if you use like Claude and build a private instance of Claude, your data isn't or it is as public as your SharePoint data is. So it's from Claude. <laughs> Uh, I suppose uh, you could probably change it to whatever you wanted. Claude is just the name of the company. Okay. We want to, we want to keep. We want to keep. Sure. But you could build a Chrome extension that would go ahead and change the name anytime you see the word Claude to sell whatever you wanted. Okay. <laughs> so, so this here is more to show you, like this technology allows you to basically the building blocks to do what you're looking for. It still requires a decent amount. So a good segue would be to set up a uh, AI assessment meeting to look at it a little bit more in depth and see is this does this really have some uh, opportunity on it? And and this and the steps that we would do is we'd go back to your quoting system and Salesforce and look at what the API capabilities are, which uh, they, normally that's very public information. You just we would go back and look it up and see what can we do? Can we post data? Can we get data? What kind of data can we get? What kind of stuff can we post? Whatever. And then once we know that, then we can go back and say, okay, well, what, what do you want? You want this? Can we do it? Would be the question through those APIs. And if the answer is yes, then using something like Zapier or uh, we use Roost or building your own, you know, from scratch, uh, any of that can pull that data. We can definitely get into your mailbox and we can definitely pull invoices. We can definitely save the file to some source. So some, I'm sorry, a destination. So all that kind of stuff is definitely available within the current uh, stuff that Microsoft has available. So it's just the questions are going to be what what can we do with Salesforce and what can we do with AutoQuote? And that's that position we spoke about where we're trying to hire somebody who's who's very, very Salesforce heavy for what we do already so that we can bring some of that in-house but at the same time has the wherewithal that they can go then figure this stuff out because we don't speak the lingo. I know where we want to go, uh, at least where we want to go now. I just need somebody to go to help us get there. Yeah, we'll set up an appointment we'll talk about it. Cool. Thank you. Any other stuff you guys like to see? <laughs> Next talk, Greg, we're going to have cocktails, all right? Three o'clock <laughs> is cocktail hour. I'm that's sure after, we can twist it arm to make that after, happen. That's after five. It's only three o'clock. Five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> <laughs>